Chief of Air Force, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good morning and thank you for inviting me to this conference and giving me the opportunity to speak about climate change. A sailor, a Brit sailor, talking about climate change at an Australian air power conference. It doesn't get more disruptive than that. It's also, in fact, I'm certain it's a first, and I think it's a positive first. As you can see from the title, I've been asked to talk about what the changing climate means for the security community, including defence. I'm another pensioner. It's another set of pensioners' views. Views that I've gained in the last 10 years as I've been engaged in these issues, initially in the roles you heard described, and more recently trying to bring the academic community and policymakers together to get some of the answers. As most of you know, the climate's changing. There's nothing new there. It's always been changing. The challenge is today the pace and the nature of that change. It's become more unpredictable and it's faster. We could spend all day discussing why it's changing, and I'm very happy to do that in the Q&A or in the bar tonight. For this session, we need to accept the views of 97% of the climate scientists. That the only reason you can explain that pace of change and the nature of that change is because of human influence, in particular greenhouse gas emissions. The changes manifest themselves in a number of ways. The headline is increased temperatures, either in the atmosphere or in the oceans. But we're also seeing an increase in extreme weather events, droughts, heat waves, storm surges. They're happening in most parts of the world, but the principal focus today is in a band north and south of the equator, and with this region of the Asia-Pacific region as probably the most vulnerable. Many of you have already felt those direct effects. But it's not the physical changes that we need to think about today. It's the impact of those changes. The impact on, of reduced crop yields resulting from storm surges, droughts, flooding, or rising temperatures. One degree centigrade overnight temperature rise is 10% off rice yields. That results in price rises. Increased acidification of the seas and, and the oceans, the movement of fish stocks. Loss of spring melt after the glaciers have disappeared. Rising sea levels resulting in salt water entering into the aquifers and loss of farming land. All of these are threatening key natural resources, including food, water and land. And it's happening at a time when demand for those is going up. Growing populations, greater aspirations of a widening middle class. By 2030, we will expect 35% more demand for food, 40% for water. And despite reclamation, they don't make land anymore. Then many of you will recognise the countries and the regions where this is happening. It's the same ones that are suffering from other stresses. Food shortages, health issues, demographic problems, water shortages, population issues. Parts of the world where we've seen conflicts in the past and we'll see it in the future, either intrastate or interstate, resulting from the governments not necessarily having the capacity and the resilience to look after their citizens. So put crudely, the impact of a changing climate is like chucking a bucket of petrol on a smouldering fire, which is where you come in. Not as part-time pyromaniacs, but because climate change is not just an environmental issue. It impacts on our prosperity and our well-being. In other words, our national security. Now, at this point, I normally hear a couple of groans in the defence audience, and they go along the lines of, doesn't he know that we're busy enough? We don't need any more to be added to the equation. Or there's no security solution to climate change, so why is he talking about it? Well, let me explain why I think this is an issue for the security community, one that it needs to be engaged in, but at the same time, try and focus that engagement. It isn't because I think there's a security solution. There isn't one. There is just greater insecurity if governments and society do not act. The issue is that the security community is the government's agent for ensuring the safety and well-being of their nation's citizens, both today and in the future. And the conditions I'm describing are proposing a threat to that state of affairs. They're clearly not the only threat. We've heard more about that this morning already. Today's geographical, geopolitical environment is a complex and challenging one. As you're aware, there are many... A, we face a mixture of traditional, often state-based threats, and newer, 
transnational transboundary ones frequently involving non-state actors. The expectations of my generation that at the end of the Cold War there would be a peace dividend haven't come to pass. Many of those traditional state threats that we thought would disappear are still here, or they're re-emerging. And here I'd include activity that emanates from Eastern Europe, or the very east of Europe, the tension in the South China Sea, and also the Korean Peninsula. And also tensions as new powers grow, and they find themselves with conflicting interests in parts of the world, for example, the Indian Ocean. And you'd expect a sailor to say this, but piracy never went away. At the same time, the non-traditional threats to stability and our well-being are many. We've talked about cyber today, we've talked about terrorism or violent extremist organisations. But to that list, I think you need to add the impact of a changing climate, be it the effect of the increased frequency of extreme weather events or the onset of long-term trends. Now, that's not to say that climate change is going to be a direct cause of conflict. The consensus is that's very unlikely. Rather, we need to consider the second and third order consequences, climate change acting as a threat multiplier. What do people do when they lose their livelihood, their home, or access to affordable supplies of those resources I was talking about? Families need to be fed and housed. People need an income. Different communities will react in different ways, not least depending on their circumstances and their resilience. However, faced with these challenges, and in particular competition for resources, it's likely there's going to be an increased movement of people. Again, people are always moving. The issue today is, a, is the scale and the unpredictability of that movement. The vast majority of people who move only move in their own country, whether it's nomadic herdsmen or whether it's people moving from rural to urban areas. The UNDP in 2015 talked about 75% of the movement of populations that year being of that nature. Others will move to the next country, who may or may not welcome them. In the context of climate change, the issue that's always cited is the fence between India and Bangladesh to stop the movement of Bangladeshi people. And about 8% will go further afield, as we saw in Europe in 2015. But there's also another group of vulnerable people, the trapped populations, the ones who can't go anywhere and are particularly vulnerable and including in that has been encouraged to support or join violent extremist organisations. So what sort of examples we've got where climate change has been contributing to conflict or instability? Well two which initially was perceived by academics and experts as unlikely but now it's agreed they are, are the Arab Spring and in particular in 2010, when the wheat harvest failed in Russia because of the heat wave, at the same time as you were experiencing heavy, uh, very wet weather, and Canada was, resulted in a, in a rise in the price of wheat. Russia stopped exporting a lot of its wheat. Wheat prices go up, bread prices go up, and one of the factors that contributed to the riots in the markets in Tunisia was the price of bread. We've just acknowledged that in seven years there's been a conflict in Syria. Before that conflict, there was nearly a decade-long drought, which was extreme for that region. As a result, crops failed, farmers left the country and moved to the cities and the towns. They put pressure on towns and cities that didn't have the ability to look, at the system, look after the systems that they were already. And it exacerbated existing tensions and historical tensions, some of which are religious. Both of those are now recognised as having climate change as one of the contributing factors to the conflict and the instability. If you look to the future, and I don't think you need to look very far, the Sahel region in Africa, Lake Chad, the UN Security Council made, issued a statement in January this year acknowledging that the impact of the changing climate, and in particular the pressure on resources, was giving the organisations like Boko Haram the opportunity to increase the instability in that region. And I think Southeast Asia is another one where we need to look. In all of these instances, it's the impact of a changing climate on the availability of key natural resources that is a contributing factor. Now, if I was given this lecture in the UK or Northern Europe, or perhaps here, people say, fine, OK, I accept all that. But what's it going to do with me? We're OK. Well, the reality is, in part because I'm talking about your backyard, but also because we live in a joined-up world, one in which the impacts of local events have global consequences. An unstable world 
or, or a region has implications for all of us. And it may manifest itself in a number of ways. Volatility in the prices of key raw materials. For example, energy. 2011, the Libyan conflict, it's part of the Arab Spring. Libya produced 2% of the world's oil. It went off tap. The price went up by $20 a barrel. Two financial quarters, a $20 a barrel increase is half a percent of global GDP. In the same year, we saw disruption to the world's just enough, just in time supply chains. The floods in Thailand meant that microchips couldn't be sent and exported, microchips that were needed in cars, computers, etc. In the UK, Honda wanted to launch a new car, instead of which the workforce went on a three day working week. And whether you're in Orange County, California, Poland, or other parts of the world, there's a scarcity of laptops. The countries that are most affected by the impact of a changing climate are the emerging countries where there are markets, certainly where my country is looking to trade in the future. It is very hard to trade with countries where there's instability and, and, or conflict. I've talked about the spread of radicalization and I've talked about the movement of people. Without a stable world, we cannot have a strong economic growth. Without a strong economy, we can't afford the security we need. Geopolitical stability is not an end state in itself, it's a prerequisite. So what action does the security community need to take? And I deliberately use the term security community rather than defence or the military, because it's a community in its widest sense. It's foreign policy as well as defence and military. It's international development aid, it's home affairs and it's respective agencies. Each will have their own areas of responsibility or specific areas of interest. But as with any other 21st or most 21st century challenges, addressing the threat requires a comprehensive, collective and coordinated response. There's a need to acknowledge that not only does a changing climate pose a risk to our national security, but it needs to be treated as a mainstream risk, not a niche one. It needs to be looked at on the par with other threats. Now, many countries have achieved the first bit. They've recognised it as a threat. But there aren't many who are looking at it as a mainstream threat. Secondly, an analysis that takes, any analysis that takes place over this needs to establish what it means for our respective countries, how the risk can manifest themselves, and in what time frame. And to do that, you have to talk to some people you don't normally talk to. We've traditionally talked to certain lead experts about conflict and risk, and it's, a lot of it's been about that state-on-state -state issue, or terrorist organisations. But in developing both a baseline of knowledge and then establishing a form of early warning system, it's going to be necessary to talk to likes of long-range weather forecasters, agrarian experts, experts on the movement of populations. And if you're not sure who they are, I can assure you they're not very good at talking to the security community. A relationship is going to have to be developed. You're going to need to think through exactly what the exam question is, explain how you want that information presented, and when. If not, there'll be a three-ton truck outside Russell, and an academic will tell you the answer's in there somewhere in the middle, but you'll have to interpolate for the, for, for the exact data you want. That analysis of this threat needs to be fed into review of all the other threats. Because only then can you understand the interdependency between, and the relationship between the threat and establish the priorities for action. If you don't do that, I would suggest you've got an incomplete and flawed review or analysis of your threats, which if you feed it into your national security strategy, which you should do, is going to give you a flawed national security strategy. Now, the output might make uncomfortable reading for some particularly our political masters. But there's nothing new there, and the same applies when you're using the analysis. As I said, it needs to inform the national security strategy and subsequently the national risk registers. That may not be straightforward, because some will say, there's too much uncertainty associated with the impact of a changing climate. We can't use information. Quite frankly, that's rubbish. We never have 100% certainty for any threat. This is no different. In fact, in many ways, we probably know more about what's happening in a changing climate than we do with some of the more traditional threats. Others will say it's tomorrow's problem. It's outside the horizons of the risk registers. 
The visual evidence, I would say, tell, say, speaks differently to that. And anyway, you need to act today to reduce the risk tomorrow. And that probably presents a challenge when you're working with governments. Because this is a strategic issue that needs long-term planning. And most of society, including politicians, have short-term horizons. You've got to convince them of the need for this. In other words, all of this is about speaking truth unto power. And the information gained in that analysis can be used to inform not just the national security strategy, but other strategies, economic, energy, health, transport, etc. Because only then will you see the co-benefits. For example, if you improved air quality equals better health, less spending on health care, etc. And in the process, reduce the risk to national security. That's the security piece. What about the military specifically? Well, clearly, you've got to address the wolf nearest the sleigh, the most pressing threat. But I would argue you also need to use the analysis to inform those lower level operating environment strategies. The implications for likely missions and tasks. Now, in this region, military aid, civil power in disaster response in mainland Australia or humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the region are clearly high priorities. And on HADR, I wouldn't always assume it's going to be done in a benign environment. There's also the need for increased offshore tapestry and monitoring of your e and surveillance of your EEZ. Importantly, in a vulnerable region, working with partners and coalition partners is a need to build capacity and resilience in those countries which are fragile as part of conflict prevention. Have you got the right kit to operate in this world we're talking about in the future? Do you have the resilience? John Blackburn's talked about an energy strategy. Have you got an energy strategy that determines how you're going to use energy and what nature of energy you're going to use in defence? Are your people at the right readiness and have they got the right training? And have you got interoperability? Not with, just with the many different actors you're going to work with, but with your partners. If you're a jet pilot, you go up to the tanker to get a suck of fuel and you find he's only offering 50-50 biomix and you take normal aviation, it's not going to be the best of days. None of that is different from dealing with any other risk we face, which is why I, need, I talk about the need to be mainstream. What I do acknowledge, because of the unpredictability of climate change and the fact that people will come to you as the first responders, is you've got to work really hard to be ready for all this while still maintaining the ability to do high intensity conflict resolution that nobody else can do. So that's the theory. What about the practice? Amongst the security communities in the world, I think there's been quite a lot of progress in the last 10 years. If I think back to the first time I came here in Australia in 2010 to talk about these issues, the response wasn't very positive. One of your more robust sen senators let me know in no uncertain terms you couldn't understand why the British government was spending any money on this or using my time. DOD cancelled all my meetings because I'd appeared on late, nine, late line the night before to talk about the issues. If I look at the submission that went into the Senate Committee inquiry on the impact of a changing climate on Australia's security last year, there's been a lot of progress. Things have come a long way, including Vice Chief's appointment of a Defence Climate and Security Advisor, the fact that we're talking about these issues at this conference. But as elsewhere, I think there's more that needs to be done. I suggest we have a long way to go before there's a universal understanding of what I'm talking about, and it's not yet instinctive to include climate change and resource scarcity or resource imbalance in our security thinking. Some of these issues lie outside the security domain, with the wider society, and particularly our elected representatives. But that doesn't excuse the security community for in, from inaction. They need to acknowledge the complexity and the uncertainty of the operating environment. It's something you thrive on when you're in operations, but there's a hesitancy as soon as you get back into barracks or HQs. You've got to think about this in the policy side. That new operating environment is going to be reflected in our thinking and analysis. We've got to avoid the temptation to reverse engineer. The military are very good at reverse engineering, whether it's a midshipman doing his astro-navigation in his cabin because he failed to get up for morning stars, 
It's a forward equipment capability team. Whatever the scenario, the answer is it's either a tank, a fast jet, or a frigate. And the same happens with some of the analysis of the, of, of the threats. We know what kit we've got, we know what doctrine we've got, we know what training, so we'll reverse engineer it. We need to avoid that. There's a need to draw on your experience of other threats to develop effective early warning mechanisms, indicators and warnings, to know when the price of wheat's going up, the price of white rice is going up, or populations are moving, and build new relationships to allow that to happen, perhaps using the likes of the think tanks of ASPE or LOE. Now, all of that requires an investment of time. There's a need to share knowledge with other government departments and beyond, to work with partner nations, whether it's a traditional Five Eyes community or broader. I can't reinforce John's point, the need for an energy strategy. There's a need to get the language right. When I took over as the, as the government's climate and energy security en envoy in the Ministry of Defence, talking about soggy targets, greenhouse gas emissions targets. The Ministry of Defence was fighting two operations at the time and was under pressure and under the cost on resources. We had to change the language to things like operational capability, risk and cost. But above all, this is about leadership. Not just the truth unto power piece, but senior leadership demonstrating commitment. I've no doubt that the voices of the likes of Chris Barry, and the commitment of Angus Campbell, the fact we're talking about this today, are going some way towards broadening our understanding. But more senior voices are required with a coherent and relevant narrative. Because only then, all the activities described in those 15 pages of that submission last August will become a plan or a strategy. A plan that's sufficiently robust that it can be adapted where required, but more importantly, it can withstand the issues when, when administrations change or people move on. Thank you very much.